Hey, hey, it's me, Maggie J. Today with the final recap and review that I will ever write for Reservation Dogs. I'll be covering episodes 9 and 10, and then that'll be a wrap on this whole series. I'm recording this about two weeks after I started writing it because my work schedule has suddenly picked up and I've had like zero time to work on this video, so I don't know how long it will be before I can post, but I appreciate you being here, coming to listen to my thoughts. Not that I've been neglecting this show, though. I did appear on a podcast called The Super Not Funny Show where we talked forever about how much we loved this show. I'll put a link to it in the description. So if you want to hear some super fans ramble on about this show for a while, it's there for you. Okay, so episode nine is called Elora's Dad, and it's about exactly what you think it would be. Elora's father. We start off with Cheese, Bear, Willie Jack, and even Jackie joining Elora at the enrollment office of the College of the Muscogee Nation. Because as Willie Jack informs the receptionist, if one goes to college, they all go to college. So that's why they're all here. Soon, Elora is called back to talk with an admissions counselor, and he is so sassy and indigenous, it's priceless. He really gives her the facts. That college is harder than high school. She is going to have to put in a lot of effort, especially since she already dropped out of high school. She wants to major in mental health, which I think is a great field for her to go into. Unfortunately, there are no scholarships available, so she's going to need to submit her parents' financial information to qualify for financial aid. We know that Cookie isn't available, but there is a father listed on her birth certificate, so she's going to need to get that information from him. She tries to say that she doesn't know him or how to find him, but the counselor insists she needs this info. And to just start with Grandfather Google, she lets the rest of the dogs know about this bump in the road, and they make it seem like it's no big deal for her to find him. Bear tells her she could even have a relationship with her father like he does with his. And then he smirks because that's fucking funny right there. We don't get to see how she finds her father. I would assume she looked him up through Aunt Teenie's Facebook to find where he lives. And since he owns his own business, his address and phone number are probably easily found. So she borrows Willie Jack's mom's car and follows him around his town for a while. First at the hardware store, over to the dispensary, and then to the gas station. For being a stoner, he's rather quick to pick up on that he's being followed and goes to confront her at the gas station. As soon as he looks at her, he knows exactly who she is because she looks so much like Cookie. By the way, Rick Miller is being played by Ethan Hawke, a major heartthrob for some people from my generation, and he's also a big fan of this show. But anyway, Elora needs him to fill out this paperwork for school, so they sit down at this diner, and it is awkward. She wants to be all business, but he keeps asking questions and trying to get to know her. He explains why he named her Elora Dannon from the movie Willow. I was hoping it'd be more meaningful to him, but he says it's because Ron Howard was from Oklahoma. Sir, what the hell? He carries on giving her a bit of an apology for letting her grow up without him, but it's just excuses. During this meeting, I feel like she wants to get to know him too, but her walls are up and she won't or can't allow herself to give him anything to work with. She just wants the financial info and for him to sign off on the form and then she's out of there. Rick can't let this be the end of it though. He's got something to give her, so he runs out of the restaurant and invites her to come over to his place. When they arrive, she can see there's bikes and toys in the front yard, indicating she's got some siblings. He makes her a cup of coffee and explains he's got three kids and their mother is having an opioid problem right now, but she's in treatment and they're hoping it'll stick because the kids really miss her. She asks if he's full white and he proudly admits he's 99% white, Quakers to be specific, and they are badass motherfuckers. So... Yeah, I guess both sides of her come from strong people. He goes to look for the surprise he wants to give her, and it turns out to be a photo of her and her mother taken on her first birthday, the last time he was invited to be part of her life. She doesn't have many photos of her and her mother together, so this is a real gift. Seeing her with the photo spurs him to explain why this was the last time he saw her, but it all boils down to he wasn't ready for a family at his age, and he didn't fight to be there or provide for Elora like he should have. Then the 
the years start coming and they don't stop coming and here they are. It's almost time to get the kids from the bus stop. He asks if she will walk with him and she hesitantly agrees. He smokes a joint on the way and they discuss how Elora came to be. He and Cookie were mixed up in the typical high school party crowd. It wasn't a healthy relationship so they fought and broke up a lot and were only together for four months before she told him she was pregnant. He wasn't trying to be a father after Elora was born and he and Cookie weren't getting back together so he allowed himself to drift away and then after Cookie passed he didn't want to take Elora away from what and who she was familiar with. He was a coward and ultimately relieved to not have to be a father at that time. He spent many years being a shit ass and then he had some other kids and life got chaotic in a different way. The bus pulls up and his three kids hop off. He introduces her as their sister and the younger girl asks we have another sister? Which threw me for a loop because the phrasing is weird and makes me think maybe this isn't the first sister they've met like this or maybe I'm just listening to it wrong. Either way the kids seem unbothered meeting their sister. I have to wonder if Rick told them about her or if they're just used to him throwing curveballs at them all the time and this is another secret he's revealing at the last possible moment like usual. But whatever. The kids invite her to come eat pizza with them tonight since it's Pizza Friday. And she actually does go with them and participates in their family tradition. It's very sweet and touching and I totally lost it at the end when the older girl asks if she will come back to visit and she promises she will come by. A lot. Elora and Rick hug goodbye. And that's the end of the episode. I've been trying so hard not to insert my own experiences into this review because I am biased as hell against those who are capable of being there for their children and they just choose not to be. So I'm not giving him a pass for any of the days he neglected to be in his daughter's life. But I don't fault Elora for giving him a chance. He's literally the only parent she has, and there's these siblings who immediately accepted her as part of their family, and she seems to like them, so I understand why she's agreeing to come back and see them more. Elora needs more people in her life to be there for her. Pushing away that opportunity when she's going to be so close due to the school she chose might make her question her intentions later on down the road, so... Why not? Throughout this episode, you can absolutely feel the tension and awkwardness and the need for Rick to explain himself, which I think adds to the authenticity that goes along with seeing your child so many years after you've given up on them being in your life. I do wonder if his wife were in the picture, would he be as inviting? But that's not really important at this point. The point here is it's never too late to try and right the wrongs you've committed, as long as you own up to your actions and try to understand the consequences of the choices you made. Overall, I think Devery Jacobs wrote an incredible episode here. Yes, Miss Elora Dannon herself wrote this whole thing, and I love it. It tugs on the heartstrings and shows a lot of forgiveness and opens the door for moving forward for her as a person. And good for Elora for not being bitter about all the time she lost out on with her dad. Not sure I can make the same decision, so I have to celebrate when someone makes what feels like the right decision for themselves. Good luck to both her and her father. Now, on to the next episode, the final episode in the entire series of Reservation Dogs. It's called Dig. First off, I have to say, I was on the verge of tears for most of this episode, so if it sounds like I'm fighting my emotions or crying while discussing this, I totally am. At the end of this, I'll tell you how long my recording is, and then you look at the how long the video is, so you'll know how much I had to cut out because I was crying. Let's get to it. First off, we hear a radio show introduction, just like we did in the very first episode. I love this callback, and it still reminds me of Smoke Signals, the movie. Today, we're going back to prison to visit Hokti, Daniel's mother, Willie Jack's auntie. I'm not sure the connection between Fixico and Hokti, but it seems they had a relationship worth Willie Jack taking the time to come and tell Hokti in person about his passing. Willie Jack also shares how much regret she is holding on to regarding him. That they spent a lot of time together, but she felt she didn't learn enough and their time together was cut much shorter than she wanted. Hokti explains with a physical diagram using a bag of flaming flamers and an assortment of candy to show that his essence is being shared and carried on through those who 
who were closest to him and those closest to them, which is what creates close community bonds. This reminds me a lot of the speech given by Uncle Kenny in episode eight, also about community, and it just highlights that that's what this show has been about this entire time. During their visit, Hokti nods her head at her grandmother, the young woman in the beautiful dress that was hanging around her last time we came to prison. However, this time, the older guy Willie Jack met in the waiting room the first time she came to visit is sitting with her. Due to Hokti's description of him and what he talks about, Willie Jack says she thinks she met him. I almost thought she could see the spirits as well, but after several watch-throughs, I think she's just believing what Hokti tells her about the spirits she sees. Fun fact, the first time we met Hokti was in episode 9 of season 2 called Offerings, when she taught Willie Jack how to feel the energy of her relations. I didn't look into who this actress was at the time, but this is Lily Gladstone, who I am looking forward to seeing, starring in the upcoming Scorsese movie, Killers of the Flower Moon, alongside Leonardo DiCaprio about the Osage Nation and the tragedy that came along with them discovering and selling the oil that was found in their territory. It looks amazing, and I've been seeing rumors of her being nominated for an Oscar for this role, so I am very excited to see this movie, and even more happy to see her reprising her role here. Just about everyone who has had a role in this series makes an appearance in this episode, so I'll move on from this moment to the next one. After her visit to the jail, Willie Jack joins all all the aunties in preparing food for Fixico's funeral. And everyone is here. Rita, Bev, Willie Jack's mother Dana, Jackie, Alora, and many others who we don't know their names, but I'm pretty sure we've seen them around before. Tons of fry bread is being made in this room. That's all I can say. Meanwhile, outside, the men are trying to haul the spirit house out of Leon's truck and failing. So they take Willie Jack's advice to move the truck closer to the burial site before trying to unload it. Under a covered sitting area are the elders and those not close enough to fix a code to be given a task involved with the burial. We see Maximus is there, along with Irene, and this kid sitting beside her who is writing or maybe drawing on a notepad for, like, the entire episode. Others keep showing up, including the other half of the res dogs formerly known as the indian mafia good news white steve has a new vehicle but still nobody respects it and then the rest of the uncles show up and join irene and maximus drinking coffee and eating donuts the younger boys carry Fixico's casket into the church, and there he will lay until the next morning while his grave is being dug by hand. We did not see this part when Mabel passed, so this is another slice of tradition being revealed here. There's a line of mourners giving their last words to Fixico. Big leaves him a copy of the book Man Moon, and a bit later, Leon takes it with him. I'm not sure that's how this works, but maybe I'm wrong here. Mose and Miko leave him a signed copy of their latest album for the road such givers these two i'm glad they made as many appearances in this season as they did big is also in a giving mood so he goes to the kitchen and donates a humongous zucchini to bev and she is happy to receive it on his way out of the cookhouse he runs into aunt teeny who is on her way in you know, these two have a little romantic history between them, so he is sure to inform her there won't be any of that going on this time. He's been seeing someone. I'm glad that this scene was included because I would not have appreciated Big trying to go between these women like some kind of floozy. They don't deserve to be treated that way, and he is better than that. So I like that they went the respectful route here. Some people... They just don't seem to have that in them. Laura finds out that Rita is taking a new job in Oklahoma City and Bear will be staying behind, which makes her look uncomfortable. She goes to find Bear in the church and lets him know that she will also be leaving town to go to school. It seems like this was really difficult for her to tell him, like she's scared to leave him on his own, which is a bit weird because she had no problem leaving him behind when she and Jackie left town together, but Rita was there for him then, so maybe I've got it wrong. He tells her he's proud of her for all that she's been through and for still being so tough. Despite his reassurance, she is very upset by this conversation, leaving her friend behind, and we actually see her cry. Besides the scene with Daniel in the first first season, I don't think she's had a crying scene, so for her to let it out here with Bear, I thought it was very appropriate and meaningful. It's tough to say goodbye to your best friend, 
And you can see it through both of them during this scene. Once it gets dark outside, the men start digging the grave. The honor of breaking ground is given to Willie Jack, despite this being a task for the men. And once she has turned over the first shovelful, they realize they're short on shovels. But don't worry, here comes Uncle Kenny with a brand new haircut and a truck full of shovels. He and Ansel have saved the day, and the menfolk spend all night digging a hole big enough for Fixico to rest in peace. Meanwhile, in the cookhouse, the women are cooking up a storm. At one point, Bear takes a bathroom break and is warned not to whistle. Most natives believe whistling at night brings spirits, or worse, near, and they can haunt you, or worse. So what does Bear do? He whistles. But luckily, it's just William Knifeman that shows up. I am so glad to see him. I have missed him, and so has Bear. But he has grown a lot since the last time he saw the spirit, and has finally learned the lesson he was supposed to. That he doesn't have to be the only leader. That he is a part of the community, and it's okay for him to follow others and learn from, and lean on them. It's a powerful and difficult lesson for headstrong people to understand. Some people think that they don't want to be a burden on others, so they don't ask for help. And when others need help, they think, I had to do that by myself, so they don't offer the help that they could, which doesn't strengthen or add to the community. And as I've already said, that's been the underlying message throughout this series, to build your community and strengthen those bonds. So when it finally clicks for Bear, there's nothing left for the spirit to teach him. So off he goes into the night, leaving Bear with a different mindset than when they first met. And they're both the better for the journey they had together. When the sun rises, the grave has been dug, and soon they will all eat together before they lay Fixico to rest. But first, Willie Jack says a few words about what his presence meant to her. She talks about community and how he taught her how important it was to him by showing her how to take care of those around them. We get a little flash forward of where everyone's future is leading. Bear puts Rita's suitcase in her car and he and Jackie wave as she drives off, presumably to Oklahoma City for her new job. I had a feeling for most of this season that Bear and Jackie were going to become a couple and it appears they did. Jackie has had dark hair for this whole episode, which I think looks really beautiful on her. Cheese, the youngest, is still living with Irene, but it seems like he's not hiding away in his room playing video games anymore. They're out enjoying nature and sipping coffee together. He still remains mostly a mystery, but at least he has stability and peace and knows love. Elora has sold Mabel's house, bought that truck from her dad, and is taking the blue willow dishes with her as she heads off to college. Willie Jack picks up where Fixico left off, delivering groceries and making sure the people of the community have what they need. Then the dogs gather up and say they love each other, just the same way they did for Daniel in the very first episode. Way to bring it back all the way around. Just before the credits roll, we see Bev dragging Big out of the woods by his handcuffs. Rawr, y'all. And then the shot focuses on the elders, Uncle Bucky, Uncle Brownie, Grandma Irene, and Maximus, all sitting together, glad they were able to send Fixico off in a good way. Like a glimpse into the future for the dogs, hopefully they'll all be able to grow old and be together when it comes time to lay their friends to rest. I recently found out that Willie Jack was supposed to be a male character, so if that had actually happened, the res dogs would resemble the elders, just like this. And that's the end of the episode. End of the series, end of the show. And I think it was beautiful. Death has been a big part of this show, so it's fitting that they end with a funeral. Each death on this show has done something different to the characters, changed them in some way, and caused them to behave and make the decisions they have. So I'm glad the creators didn't shy away from showing it so often. I like that they didn't try to go too far into the future to show us where they all end up. We know where they're heading, and that's good enough for me. Plenty of the questions I've had since the beginning have been answered or rendered unimportant, so I'm really happy with this outcome. I've almost never liked the final episodes of shows I've loved watching, 
they wind up going in a weird direction or leaving me without answering any of my questions. So this was really amazing to watch. Overall, the entire message of this show has been to appreciate your community, to not take those around you for granted, to be there and do more for others, and build that framework as strong as you can so everyone can rely on it when it's their time to need support. It feels like there has been a resurgence of indigenous culture and interest in traditional ways happening over the last few years, thanks largely to the internet bringing people together and allowing them to share what they know and celebrate that there are so many like them to be found. I hope to keep seeing this moving forward so no more knowledge is lost and future generations can understand what kind of people they come from. If a show like this can spur more to reach out and learn and explore their roots, I think that's the best possible outcome. And I'd like to thank Sterling Harjo and all those who worked on this show for making this happen. It's been an incredible journey from where they started to where they wound up. I'm happy I was able to watch and discuss it all the way through. I've said it several dozen times, but this show has been so great. I can't recommend it enough. I hope everyone gets to see it and take away at least a little bit of the message that community matters and everyone has their role to play in theirs. I have to stop now, but if you want to hear me talk more about how much I love this show, please go check out the two-hour conversation I had with the Super Not Funny show about it and let us know what you think. Thank you so, so much for watching all of these episodes. It's been so wonderful to make these recaps and reviews. I hope you've enjoyed them. I don't know where this channel will go after this, but if you care to listen to me ramble about the shows I like to watch, please subscribe. If you are here just for Res Dogs content, thank you for adding to the view count. Don't forget to like this video on your way out, and y'all, stay safe out there.